blockchain itself has half the information that's needed to confirm the rights of, of, of uh, ownership in Bitcoin. Um, the other half is your password. So in order for Bitcoin to transfer, you have to have both the blockchain and your password. And those two things together can be used to validate your rights uh, from which uh, you can transfer your Bitcoins to someone else. And everyone, generally speaking, has their own copy of the blockchain so that they can confirm that all the transactions that have been made are valid. All right. So another really common question that someone that people ask when they first hear about Bitcoin is they say, well, what is Bitcoin backed by? I kind of understand that um, maybe at one time uh, we used gold as a medium of exchange. And so the gold itself was what was valuable. And we would exchange the gold or we would exchange a certificate that you could redeem for gold. What's Bitcoin backed by? And the answer is basically very little. Um, when you have Bitcoin, what you can um, attest to is that at one point in the past or at multiple points in the past, cryptographic problems have been solved. And you, look, you can establish that by looking at the blockchain and seeing the transfer of rights as one Bitcoin moves from another person, from, from one person to another person and to the next person and to the next person and eventually to you. You can look in the blockchain to go back to the very beginning of where that um, Bitcoin came from. And you can see that initially the Bitcoin uh, was established by solving a cryptographic problem that took a computer at some point, uh, as, you know, a non-trivial amount of time in order to solve. And so Bitcoin comes or, or, or is created by the solving of cryptographic problems. So what is it backed by? Well, sometimes people call this a proof of work. Um, and what that means is that Bitcoin validates that at one point in the past, some work has been done in order to bring that Bitcoin into existence. Um, but that's it. There's, um, there's nothing else uh, supporting Bitcoin um, from some sort of a mm, tangible or physical um, point of view. So in order to get Bitcoin, there's only two things you can do. Uh, you, can, um, have some, you, can, you can convince someone to give you Bitcoin, either by selling them something or by doing work for them or through a gift or some other mechanism. They can give you Bitcoin in the same way that someone can give you dollars through a transaction. The other thing that you can do is you can try and solve some of these computational uh, challenges um, in order to create a new Bitcoin. And solving these computational contests is what's called mining. And mining is uh, a process by which uh, that blockchain is extended, in which the ledger book, in which all the transactions are written, uh, you add a new page to that ledger book by solving, by winning these computational contests. And that computational contest uh, then it creates Bitcoin from nothing uh, that you have a right uh, to spend if you solve that if you solve that contest. All right. So there are two ways to get Bitcoin. Uh, you can either get it because someone gives it to you, or you can get it by solving one of these cryptograph these computational contests, which is more commonly known as mining. Um, although mining has become a very specialized activity now, and so trying to do it. Uh, with a basic computer is unlikely to be very successful. Okay, so this ledger book that contains all of the transactions that have been done in the Bitcoin blockchain or in the, in the Bitcoin ecosystem is called a blockchain. And what you can think about in terms of a metaphor is you can think about the blockchain as being a book. And you can think about each page in this book as being one block. And on each page of the book are all the transactions that have taken place between people as they transfer rights to spend Bitcoin from one person to another. And so just like a book has many pages, a blockchain has many blocks. Each page of a ledger has several different transactions and each block in the blockchain chain lists many different transactions that have happened at a moment in time in the Bitcoin ecosystem. And so on the, um, on the graph here, on the slide here, you can see um, on the top a uh, schematic diagram of how the blockchain is laid out. And we'll look at that in more detail later in the class. And this graph shows over for a period of time the number of transactions that are in each one of those blocks, or the metaphor of the ledger book, the number of transactions that are on each page of this ledger book. And you can see that over time it's been, it's been growing slightly. There's a maximum number of uh, transactions that can be on one page of this book. 
uh, but most of the time it's not hasn't been maxed out and you can see that the number of transactions varies anywhere from maybe I don't know 150 to 400 transactions um, at a given time on a given page before the page is sealed uh, by someone who's mining and the, and the page is turned and the next page in the ledger book is started or the next block in the blockchain is added. All right. So as of April 12, 2013, as a moment in time, there are 231,012 blocks on the blockchain. That's like 231,000 pages in the ledger book. And it takes about 24 hours when you first load up your Satoshi client in order to get that full uh, blockchain downloaded from all the other peers that are participating in the uh, Bitcoin ecosystem. All right. Um, so like we said, um, there's no one keeping, there's no central authority that's keeping track of all these rights. Bitcoin has no central authority. Instead, all those rights are being maintained uh, in the ledger book or on the blockchain. And the way that it's being done is through an agreement that all these programs have made in the computer code to agree to the cryptographic protocols, the ways in which passwords can be used in order to transfer rights from one person to another. And so no one will accept, meaning none of the computer code in this um, ecosystem will accept that you have any Bitcoin unless you can also produce the cryptographic key or password that can be validated against the blockchain in order to transfer it. Transfer it. Um, these keys generally are produced by software. All right. All right. So now, one of the one of the implications of Bitcoin having no central authority is that there's no recourse in many situations for things that go wrong. For example, if you buy something with Bitcoin and then change your mind and decide that um, you want to return it, but the, if the seller doesn't want to return it to you or doesn't want to give you your Bitcoin back. There's no way that you can get the Bitcoin back. Once you make a transaction, once you transfer rights from one person to another person, unless that other person makes a similar transaction back to you, there's nothing you can do to get your Bitcoin back. There's no way that you can um, reverse that transaction um, by yourself or by appealing to a, a higher authority. Similarly, if you lose your cryptographic key, if you lose your password, uh, there's no way you can get your Bitcoin back either because there's no one else that's keeping track of this for you. And this is seen as both um, something, um, uh, it's something different than the way many of our payment systems work now. It's also seen as a strength of the system by many of the people who have created Bitcoin um, as it puts all of the responsibility um, on the person who has a cryptographic key. And in that sense, it frees them um, from uh, being responsible to a central authority um, for this money. Um, contrast this, for example, to the credit card system. We're not used to not being able to reverse transactions. If we decide to pay for something with a credit card and it turns out that the person that we paid defraud, uh, fraud, is involved in fraud in some way, they steal our money, they don't deliver the goods that they said they were going to deliver, we can appeal to a payment system like Visa or MasterCard and ask them to give us our, our money back. And following a sort of established procedure, Visa or MasterCard uh, will then do that. Um, instead, Bitcoin is a little bit more, more like mailing cash through the mail. If you put a bunch of physical bills into an envelope, seal it, put an address on it, and put it in the US post, Postal Service, it'll get sent to the seller wherever they are and there's really no way that you can get that cash back unless you have some kind of relationship with the seller and they agree to send it back to you. That's more like what a transaction with Bitcoin is like. All right. I said earlier that Bitcoin is anonymous. And so let me just be specific about what I mean by that. How can a system um, that has complete transparency in the sense that we have a ledger book and we can see every single transaction that happens, how can we say that that complete transparency supports anonymity? Well, the way we do that is because although there's this ledger book that everyone has access to and everyone can see, the transfer of rights from one cryptographic key to another cryptographic key, um, that transfer can be seen and can be validated. But there's no reason that um, anyone has to reveal that a particular cryptographic key belongs to them. 
So although you can see Bitcoin transferring from one key to another key, you have no idea who those parties are that are involved in the transaction. And so the anonymity comes from the fact that the person that controls the key is actually anonymous. And you can validate the Bitcoin's moved, and if someone emerges and presents the key um, to you in person, you know that it's them. But as long as the transactions are happening online, and a person doesn't reveal their identity being associated with a key, um, there's no way to tell from the blockchain uh, who the Bitcoin uh, was transferred to or from whom it came. All right, so this is just uh, uh, a graphic that demonstrates the anonymity of Bitcoin. So this is a graphic that shows all of the initial transactions that have happened between parties in the, uh, in the Bitcoin blockchain in the very beginning of the Bitcoin ecosystem. And just from this, the different dots represent different parties and the arrows represent a transfer of Bitcoin from one party to another party. The larger the um, circle, the more money each cryptographic key received. And from this, we can deduce that money has moved through the system, but we don't know the identity of the person who's responsible for each of the keys in the system. So we can see the transfer, but it remains anonymous. Similarly, you can go online to blockchain.info and you can look in real time at all the different transactions that are happening between people on this, in this ledger book in a web-based interface. And from this uh, website, you can see all the anonymous transactions. You can see some details about the IP address from where, from, from where the transaction uh, came from, but you have no information about who the different parties are that are exchanging Bitcoins. So although Bitcoin is anonymous, in order to actually set up a transaction, anonymity might have to be broken. So it's fine to say that two parties remain anonymous, but if I actually want to buy something from you, at some point I'm going to have to communicate with you in order to know what you have to sell and for me to express my interest in buying, and then for us to exchange the cryptographic keys so that I know where to send my Bitcoin to. So in that process of establishing a transaction, um, some of the anonymity can be broken. Um, that's built into the Bitcoin blockchain system. All right. Um, the last technological point I brought out is that Bitcoin is non-inflationary. So here on the graph on the right, you can see that um, over time, the number of Bitcoins is going to level off. And this is capped as part of the algorithm. Um, and based on this algorithm, there's no one that can create more of them. And so over time, if the use of Bitcoin continues to grow, then the value of each individual Bitcoin can also be expected to grow as well. And that things will sell um, in contrast to, some, to an inflationary currency. Um, the cost of things will tend to go down um, in a thriving, growing Bitcoin economy because people uh, want Bitcoin, more Bitcoin than is available. Right? So in a, an inflationary system uh, like the standard economy with dollars, over time dollars lose value. Um, the number of Bitcoin in the system is capped. And so over time, if the Bitcoin economy continues to thrive, then the value of the Bitcoin uh, should continue to grow because there's, the, there's not more Bitcoin available. And if the, de the demand for Bitcoin increases, then the value of the existing Bitcoin will increase. Okay, so in summary, Bitcoin is a technology that's like a pipe in some ways. And when I say it's like a pipe, I mean that those parts of the Bitcoin uh, ecosystem that involve the ledger book and the transactions and the rights transfer, um, that, that's a technology that acts like a pipe and it has some key properties. Um, there's no central authority. Uh, there's no central point of failure because many different, um, all the different people that are participating in the Bitcoin ecosystem are all keeping the system up and running. So if one of those um, computers goes offline, the Bitcoin system keeps operating as long as there are at least several of these computers uh, online. There's no central authority that controls the issuing of Bitcoin. It's all, it's all controlled through the code that's written by a collective of people. And so if you want to get Bitcoin back after you make a transaction, you can't. There's no central authority to which you can appeal. Bitcoin transactions are anonymous in the sense that when Bitcoin moves from one person to another person, who those people are is unknown, although the transaction is viewable. And then finally, the amount of Bitcoin that's ever going to be available is capped at about 21 million. Bitcoin operates both as a pipe, meaning a mechanism by which Bitcoin can be moved between people. It also functions as water, meaning that 
the Bitcoin itself that's represented in this ledger book uh, ha is transferred through the Bitcoin software from one person to another. So you use Bitcoin in order to transfer Bitcoin, right? So two different ways in which we can think about Bitcoin and some of the technological properties about Bitcoin. So with that, we're gonna um, bring this uh, lecture to a close. Uh, those are some basic starting points for talking about Bitcoin and some of the properties that it has. And uh, we'll continue to talk about this and flesh out some of the details and think about some of the implications for all this um, as the class continues. Thank you very much. Thank you.